Good morning, Northminster, and welcome to our online worship service for this Sunday. It is so good to be joined by all of you online and at home. I hope you all had a safe and healthy 4th of July weekend. It's good to be back, gathered back here as a whole this Sunday morning. We are continuing this Sunday in our sermon series, Letters to Churches. This is a sermon series about the Apostle Paul and the letters that he wrote in order to do long distance church. Last week we looked at the book of Philippians, Paul's love letter to the church in Philippi. This week it is a bit harder. We've been going through Paul's letters chronologically, and this week it lands us on the book of Philemon. Philemon is one of the shortest of Paul's letters. It is only one chapter long, but the subject matter is tough. So if you want to dive deeper into the history and the context of this difficult book, I invite you to join us on Wednesday mornings for our Zoom Bible study. We gather at 10 o'clock online and we dive into the text itself. The only thing you need to join into this Bible study is to read the text beforehand and take note of what you find familiar and what you find shocking or surprising. If you are unable to make this Bible study but still want to dive into some theology and hear from great thinkers in our life today, I invite you to check out the Presbytery's Conversation on Racism. Part 1 and Part 2 have been recorded and are available online. I will link the dis those discussions in the description below. These are pastors and leaders of the church in the Detroit area talking about racism and our response as the church today. Once again, these are hard conversations to have, but they are necessary, especially in the time and place that we find ourselves today. So with that in mind, let us join our hearts and mind together to begin our worship today. I invite you to join me in the call to worship. When we stand at the edge of fear and worry, God invites us to step into the waters of faith and trust. When we stand at the edge of the world's pain and need, Jesus invites us to step into the land of humble service. When we stand at the edge of our hunger and thirst, the Spirit invites us to sit at table of grace. Let us pray. God ever with us, you draw us to your heart so that, cradled in compassion, we might see the brokenness of all those around us. Teacher beside us, you draw us near to yourself so that by following you, we may discover the deep joy of serving the broken of the world. Spirit within us, you draw near to us with your peace so that, reconciled and restored to God, we may be the healers to the world shattered by despair. God in community, holy in one, as we draw near to you at this time. Amen. Faith not 
virtues by reaching out, stretching minds and enlarging hearts, sharing struggles, living prayer, binding up the broken parts, till we find the common place, ripe with witness to Our scripture today is from Paul's letter to Philemon, verses 8 through 16. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useless, useful to both you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. The word of our Lord. Would you all pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. Spirit of the living God, melt us. Melt us and mold us. Fill us and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us again today. Amen. The sermon this morning is not going to be an easy sermon. I'm not opening it with a fun family story. I'm going to dive straight into it. Yes, we are going to talk politics this morning, but we're not going to talk about my politics or my political beliefs but we're going to talk about the politics of scripture and how it's occasionally used. We're going to talk about politics this week because of the scripture specifically we are dealing with. And they, the scripture this week has had a lot of political implications over the centuries. And we need to air out some of the dirty laundry sometimes. I know this is uncomfortable. It's not fun. I don't go to this sermon with gleeful joy. But at the same time, we cannot ignore some of the less pretty sides of our scripture. We have to own up to the past and how Christianity has occasionally been weaponized against people. We can't say that it's not in our tradition, so let's talk about it. So I invite you to take a moment and take a deep breath. Because <sighs> this is going to be hard to hear. And I know it. It's not easy for me to say it to you. I imagine what your reactions are going to be. So I invite you to have an open heart and to hear out some of the history in our tradition this week. The fact of the matter is the book of Philemon is in our holy scripture and people have used it for political agendas. But if we're honest, we will also admit that we use our own selected text to back up many of our political beliefs. 
if I am being completely 100% honest with you, I would fully claim that the foundation of my political beliefs come from my faith, although we're not going to talk about what those are. So, before we dive into the messy history in the book of Philemon, I am going to summarize the entire point of my sermon right now. If you take nothing else away, this is the message I want you to hear. If you don't speak up about what you believe, someone else is going to speak up for you. Let me say that again. If you do not speak up about what you believe, someone else will speak up for you and you might not like what they say on your behalf. So in the third century, debates were breaking out about what books should be officially considered part of the canon, part of the Christian canon. Specifically in the 3rd century, they were debating which Jesus books should be included. And the book of Philemon was on the chopping block, the center of debate. On the one hand, Philemon is undoubtedly, unquestionably one of Paul's personal letters. On the other hand, Philemon is intensely personal and lacking in Paul's normal spiritual advice. It deals with a very specific time and place and a specific situation that Paul had on his hands. The letter is specifically written to a man named Philemon when Paul was in prison. The letter concerns the status of a man named Onemus. Onemus is one of Philemon's slaves. It is revealed that Onemus had run away and likely caused some property damage along the way or else stolen something from Philemon. Somewhere along the way, Onemus joined the crowd of the people tending to Paul's needs, visiting him daily, bringing him food, bringing him skins of water. So eventually, so taken with Paul's message of the gospel, Onemus had converted to Christianity. But this posed a new situation to Paul. See, as a Christian, you were supposed to reconcile and ask for forgiveness. And Onemus, in order to ask forgiveness, would have to be reconciled with his master, who was also a Christian and a follower in Paul's tradition. So what is Paul to do as he finds this person who is good at serving Paul's needs, but as a Christian needs to be reconciled? So what does Paul do but writes to Philemon and sends Onemus home? But Paul isn't asking for Onemus' freedom on his behalf. That's not what Paul is doing here. The uncomfortable truth of this book is that Paul is asking for a transfer of property, of human property. Paul writes that he could demand that Philemon give Onemus to Paul as a gift at, to the apostles, but Paul would rather it be given in kind. Paul would rather Onemus be a gift that Philemon gives of his own accord. He doesn't want to force Philemon. I mean, Onemus, in Paul's words, was useless to Philemon. Because Onemus ran away and caused all this damage. But Paul had made Onemus useful. Paul had converted him and now he was a very useful servant. So Paul offers to clear the debt of Onemus if Philemon would be so kind as to give Paul the gift of a servant, a slave that Paul would own. Paul gives no indication that he intends to free him, 
In fact, Paul indicates the opposite, that Paul has work for Ornemus to do. It hurts to hear in so blunt a terms, and to know that one of the founders of our faith writes about owning another human being. What hurts even more is seeing how this scripture was used. This book was used to justify not only slavery. See, even the Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, said slavery was okay. In various parts, he talks about slaves don't ask for your freedom. Can I have Onemus? But this book was also used to justify the capture of runaway slaves and returning them to their masters. That is the uncomfortable truth of this book. Yes, I know and I understand all the interpretation you can do to get around this uncomfortable truth. Yes, I know that scripture was written in a different time than our own and we have to look at it in context with the historical situation. Yes. Yes, I know many will point out that Greco-Roman slavery was not the same as the chattel slavery of the American South. Yes, I know that Paul speaks lovingly towards Onemus, and we can dream that Paul wanted to set him free. Yes, I know that many will say that Paul is progressive for his time. Yes, I know that Paul cannot tear down the entire system of slavery himself. Yes, I know that Paul was just one actor navigating his world and his time and his place with his social norms and the imaginative capacity of one flawed human. Yes, I know all the arguments that folks put forward to avoid the uncomfortable truth that this book presents us. We're the founder of our faith, one of the original members that help spread it through the known world at the time is boldly asking one person for the right to own another person. If nothing else, this book, this letter with one chapter and 25 verses shows us that social politics has always been in the mix. This is church politics at its finest in many ways. You can hear it in Paul's tone, how he is trying to negotiate with another church member how to get his wants, how to get what he wants in the world. He is deferential to Philemon. He is courteous. He is playing church politics because there is a, a mission he is trying to accomplish. And this isn't the only verse in the book or the only book in the Bible that has been used to political ends. In this part, I considered whether or not I should list all the different books and the ways that scripture has been used for political ends. But frankly, I was overwhelmed about what to include. And I get the sense that you all must know what I'm talking about, right? Do I need to recount them? The way that Joshua was used to justify the removal and genocide of the American Indians. The way that Paul was weaponized against female leadership in the church. The way that Levitical law has been used against the LGBTQIA community. Do I need to say any more? And while Philemon seems like an issue in the past, many of these other scriptures are not. There is still many scriptures being weaponized against people and being used for purely political ends. You all have seen it, right? The unpretty truth is that people dealt with politics at the time when our scriptures were written. 
It may be harder to tell because we are not in the political moment that these books were written at the time. But we can see the way that politics worked its way into our scriptures for better or for worse. We don't have to agree with the politics though. We just need to realize when the politics are at play. And to do this, I rely on a proverb I heard a long time ago. It says, read everything on the page, including the white spaces. This means that there is everything that we need for our spirituality on the page, but it may not always be in the text. It may be in the spaces around the text that give us space to disagree with what's being said. Sometimes scripture challenges us because we disagree with it and we can see the politics at play and we can move beyond it. So when we see scripture bleeding into politics and politics bleeding into scripture, what do we do? There's a litmus test that was given to us by Jesus that all the laws and the rules in the Bible boil down to just one. Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Against these there is no law. And all of the law and the prophets hinges on just these two rules. So the white spaces on the page give us room to apply this rule that Jesus gave us. It gives us room to disagree with what's being said. So in our text for today, I disagree that it is okay to ask one person for permission to own another human being. Because to love my neighbor as myself is to ask the question, do I want to be owned by someone? And that answer is a very big no. I don't want to be owned by another human being, so I don't think it's okay to own another human being. Even if a character in the Bible seems okay with it. Look at the white pages on the page and be okay with disagreeing with scripture in that area. But I do agree with Paul on one thing. I agree in the manner in which he acts. And by that I mean Paul asks boldly for what he thinks will further the kingdom of God. In the book of Philemon, Paul puts forward what he wants without hesitation. Yes, he's playing politics to make sure that Philemon answers his request in the way that he wants to, but he is bold in asking for it. So I disagree with what he is asking, but I appreciate that he's asking it boldly. And I do honestly believe that Paul thinks that this is the right thing to do because he believes that Onemus will help him further the kingdom of God. And the flip side of this is that if Paul didn't ask boldly with, for what he wanted, someone else in the room may have found out that Onemus was a runaway slave and may have reported back to his master. Paul could have left it to the politics at play and stayed out of it, but Onemus' future may have been very different. So instead, Paul asks for what he wants, what he believes is right. He speaks up for what he believes in. So in that same way, I am challenging you to speak up for what you want to see in this world. There are so many people in this world today clamoring to know what all Christians believe. And I'll be honest with you, I disagree with a lot of what supposed Christians believe. I became a pastor in part because there was a group claiming to speak for all of Christianity that I disagreed with. So I wanted to be a voice to say no. 
We don't all believe that way. But it is the congregation's responsibility to also speak out, to say when you disagree with something, to speak boldly when you want something changed. So this week, in the spirit of Paul's boldness, I am inviting you to write a letter that is specifically political. I am not dictating what you write about. I very clearly want to state, I am not telling you what I want you to write about, but I want you to write to a city official, to write to our state government or to our national government. It can be to the city council or to the U.S. Senate. But I challenge you this week to speak boldly about the future you want to see. I want you to speak about what you think the kingdom of God looks like. I want you, in the spirit of Paul's boldness, to find your own boldness, to speak with confidence and love, and to speak about what your beliefs lead you to believe. Because there's plenty of people that are willing to speak for you if you don't speak up. And if someone else does, because heaven knows people are using scripture in weaponized ways. If you let other people speak for you, they will possibly say things that you disagree with. They will use scripture in ways that you don't believe is honest and true. People are still using scripture in political ways to justify oppression of other people. They're using it in discriminatory ways, in ways that does not challenge us to love more, to love deeper, to love wider. So speak up, speak boldly in the name of the gospel. And remember that just because we call scripture holy doesn't mean that the writers didn't have political agendas that didn't have personal interest at times that bleeds into what we read. The key is that we may be able to see it for what it is, read the white spaces around it, and challenge it with whether it matches God's message of love. There is a lot of politics at play in our scriptures, but our scriptures must also inspire us to action and at times political action so that all people are clear about God's message of love in our world today. So be bold, speak out, and proclaim God's message of love. Thanks be to God. Amen.
As we turn to our prayer of the people this week, I want to first, as always, say a word about giving. I say thank you again and again and again. Truly, our work as the church is possible because people invest in it. In our Bible study this week, when we are looking at Philippians, we see how Paul thanked the church in Philippi for sending money to support his ministry. We talked about how you ha money still guides a lot of what goes on in the world today. Which means you have to finance things that you want to see. You have to put your money into the things that will make the world turn into the world you hope to see. And so I thank you so much that you have given money to Northminster Presbyterian Church and believed in our vision in working towards making the kingdom of God a reality in the world today. If you have, haven't given to Northminster and you like what we're doing, you like what we stand for, I invite you to either send a check in the mail to our address, there's people in the office checking the mail, or feel free to give online. It's an easy, takes two minutes to set up a profile online and then you can give as many times as you want. We have a new giving opportunity that has been made known to us. The details as I record this are still coming in, but I'll link the information in the description below for Sunday morning. But SOS Lighthouse is a homeless shelter that normally moves from church to church as church bodies take care of the people who find themselves homeless and without a place to go. Due to concerns of COVID-19, churches are no longer able to welcome in these children of God and take care of them. So instead, SOS Lighthouse has been putting them up in hotels, and this costs money. Once again, it takes money to put forward the kingdom of God and the vision of the world we want to see. So there is a new campaign to raise money to make sure that these families can stay safe and healthy in their stays in the hotels as they get on their feet, as they acquire jobs and housing and secure the things they need for a stable and healthy lifestyle. So I invite you in this month of July to put, to consider giving to Lighthouse SOS. It is truly a way to answer Jesus' call when Jesus asks us, When was I hungry and you fed me? When was I naked and you clothed me? Our answer should be, Here I am, Lord. This is when I have done it. But with that, with all our concerns on our hearts and minds, let us lift them up in prayer to our God today. We thank you, O Lord. For in your loving wisdom, you created one human family with a diversity that enriches our communities. We pray to you, O Lord, that we always recognize each member of this human family as being made in your image and beloved by you with worth and dignity. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may envision a way forward to heal the racial divisions that deny human dignity and the bonds between all human beings. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may affirm each person's dignity through fair access for all to economic opportunity, housing, education, and employment. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may have eyes to see what is possible, 
when we reach out beyond fear, beyond anger, to hold the hands of our sisters and our brothers. We thank you, O Lord, for your call and challenge to us that we may reveal your teachings and your love through our actions to end racism and to pro proclaim that we are all your children, heirs to your sacred creation. And so we pray together the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. today, I hope 
that you find a boldness in God's love. Yes, it's uncomfortable when our scriptures are too political for our wants. It would be easier at times if our scriptures were spiritual and beyond this world, but that's not what we have. We have a book written by flawed human beings with political agendas. May it inspire us, even when we disagree with what it says and disagree with how it's been used. May it inspire us more to speak out, to be bold, to declare and ask boldly for what we want this world to look like. Because if we do not speak out for what we want this world to look like, someone else will. And there's no guarantee that you will agree with what they say. So, may the Spirit of God inspire you. May you go out in joy and be led forth in peace. God has made the path ahead. It is Jesus who calls us forward with Jesus' message of love. And it is the Spirit that guides our feet along the path and may the Spirit also guide our voices as we learn to speak out. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.